Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And you all ought to take a moment sometime to come early and sit over there and watch your fingers fly across the piano keys uh, in the chill of the morning. It's really awesome, Catherine. Thank you so much uh, for coming and filling us with music. Welcome, everybody. It is good to be with you in worship this resurrection morning uh, to celebrate. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. It's been an amazing week of theology and biblical stories and walking through what some of those original disciples may have walked through. And we've come to that day, on that third day, that Jesus promised he'd come back and make things right. And we come to celebrate that he has done that and has then given us the power to make things even more right. We do welcome you to worship this morning. Uh, sing to the neighbors. This is the... <laughs> The one day of the year when we let all the neighbors know we're really here, uh, besides flea market when we take all of their parking spaces. Um, but sing to the neighbors this morning. After worship this morning, we invite you to take your chairs back in around the tables in the fellowship hall, join us for a light breakfast, and then to come back and join us again. At 9.30, we're opening the entire campus to just a wonderful, what we call, journey to Jerusalem, a day of activities around the resurrection celebration. Uh, yes, a petting zoo. Oh, by the way, uh, Therapy Clydesdale is coming, so if you need therapy from a Clydesdale. Uh, I'm sure they had Clydesdales in Jerusalem that first year, uh, right? But just, just a fun way to remember that Jerusalem was a mess, and it was chaos the day even of the resurrection. And so we come for that. And then at 1045, we're joining over in our gymnasium for yet another worship service that will present the word in a very dramatic pageant way um, and celebrate with lots of folks. So we invite you to come and be with us for all of that. Um, and join us next Sunday. An interesting look at what happened to Peter and what happened to Judas in those days following all of this. So we invite you to come back and be with us. It is an incredibly glorious day. How lucky we are, in some ways, uh, that we are here toward the end of April, so it's a little bit warmer uh, this year. For those of you who come every year to this, we're not huddling so much. Um, but it is a day of wonder and celebration. Hear the story from Mark's Gospel. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They'd been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. And they entered the tomb. And as they did, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, don't be alarmed, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place where they laid him. So go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and they fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone because they were really afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's stand and sing our praise. Thank you. 
gracious and holy God. Here we are, this resurrection morning, to gather early as those disciples gathered early, going with the women, trying to figure out what is this all about? Were your promises true? Can we trust you? We put all our hopes and dreams in this Jesus. We gave our lives to him so that he might lead us to you. And in this story, it led to his death, a brutal and awful death on the cross and a burial in the tomb. <coughs> and sometimes, like those early disciples, all our hopes and dreams are dashed when those difficult things come to us in our lives. But we come this morning to celebrate that your promises are true, that you did raise Jesus from the dead, that you brought life from death, and he is the Messiah, and he is leading us to you. So God, this morning, we gather early to give our lives to you yet once again, to praise you for your incredible grace that we know this day. That though we, like those disciples, sometimes run and hide, you come and find us. And you forgive us. And you still allow us to be your disciples. And you still promise us that we get to be with you forever. So thank you. Thank you for this glorious day. Amen. Oh. 
Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising again. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified. Freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. There's a reason why you hear so much good Christian music out there in the world. And there's, in some ways, a reason why you don't hear a lot of uh, religious music from a lot of other religious traditions. The incredible joy that we know through God and Jesus the Christ makes us sing. Even those of us who can't sing. Right? The music is filled with the story of God's grace in this Jesus the Christ. And that is something for which we are grateful. Giving, in lots of ways, is never required. But it is a human response to say thank you to God. The monies that we share together at this church give us opportunities like this to share the good news in music to the community, in music to the community, in music in all our children's lives. So we invite you during this time of offering to give in ways that are right for you, that this church can continue its ministry and mission out in the world. Let's pray and bless this offering. Gracious and holy God, thank you for this beautiful morning. May everything about this day be about you and what you've done for us and for all. Amen.
it's just an interesting moment as, as I was sitting down to take note that um, if you can see up over there is the moon and up over here is the sun. And what a great place for us to be if I hadn't already written a sermon. Uh, I, I talked to you about this place that we live as Christians in between the shadows of the night and the brightness of the day. And how... Okay, I'll, I'll save that for another day. Um, oh, maybe there's a teaser for next year's uh, Easter sunrise service. So, Lord, if you could provide that again, it would be lovely. But... Looking at Mark's gospel and the way that Mark writes this story of the resurrection morning, um, in some ways makes me giggle. The women fled. <laughs> they totally hightailed it out of there. They went to the tomb, expecting to finish the anointing process that they had hoped to do on Friday, but weren't allowed to do because of all of their religious rules and regulations. When Jesus had died on the cross and they laid him in the tomb, they were going to anoint his body for burial and leave it there and be done, but it was time to get home and celebrate the Passover. How do you do that? But according to all their religious regulations, they had to leave him. It wasn't until early that morning on that third day, that they were able to go and finish the process that they had wanted to do for the one that they had loved so much. And there, there was an empty tomb. And some guy sitting there in white, and they were scared. Would, wouldn't you be? I mean, come on, it had, it had been this amazingly weird week. Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem on the pole of a donkey, okay, not so great, not a, not a Clydesdale. Um, and people are taking off their jackets and they're cutting branches from soft trees and they're laying them down, creating this, this sort of red carpet and they're, they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's, it's great and it's wonderful. And his disciples are like, finally, he's getting the recognition he deserves and this is going to be a great week. Hosanna, they yelled, which means, holy heck, look, something really important is happening. And then they get to Thursday. And it's the beginning of the Passover celebration, which is a wonderful celebration. It's the remembrance of how God had led the people out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. Remember as it parted and, and the Israelites were saved and their captors were drowned and they wandered for 40 years, and yet 40 years later, they found their way back into the promised land, and God established them as a great people, and, and things came back together. It, the Passover meal was important, and Jesus had celebrated that with them for the last couple of years, and, and they celebrated the greatness of God, and then suddenly in the Passover meal, Jesus takes the bread that was before them, and he breaks it open, and he said, this is like my body broken for you. You ought to eat this. And then he, he takes the pitcher of, of wine or juice or whatever it was, and pours it out into a cup, and he says, this is, this is like my blood that's poured out for you. You need to drink from this. And in good Jesus fashion, he, he takes everything deeper and surprises them in what has become ordinary and reestablishes the extraordinary. Nobody understood. But the disciples were moved deeply by his presence, by just his demeanor, by his words. And then he announces that one of his beloved disciples, somebody who had dipped bread into the cup, somebody who had shared this meal with him, would betray him. Somebody would deny him. Judas slips away and does just that. Jesus takes the, 
disciples into the garden and goes off to pray. And of course, while he prays, they all nod off. They had a little extra wine. Jesus predicts that Peter will deny him. Jesus gets arrested because Judas gives a signal to the arresters by giving him a kiss, which is not what a kiss is for. He's held in a trial, if you can call it a trial. Nothing was fair about it. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was scourged. May I remind you, scourging is one of the worst things that we human beings have ever invented. Long leather straps with sharp metal shards at the ends that dig mercilessly all night long. Then in the daybreak of Friday, he was made to carry this huge crossbeam through the town where people were weeping and others were laughing and and then if scourging wasn't bad enough, they crucified him. Which after going through all of that, probably was a relief. But it's a horrible death. Those who were crucified died of suffocation. They, they didn't die because they bled to death. They, they died because they couldn't catch their breath. Their bodies were so heavy when they the cross. Have you ever not had a chance where it was hard to breathe? in this pollen season. Multiply that. This is all of what the disciples were watching as Jesus died. And out of love for their hope with what he placed in this man and the love that he had shown them, they, they buried him. It was the best of what they could do. It was amazing. Uh, the leaders in the town put a Roman guard at the tomb. Ever seen the Queen's guards? Have you ever been to London? Have you ever had a chance to stand in their face? <coughs> right? <coughs> you know how you do that to people and they start going like this? I mean, you could do it to them all day long, all night long, and those guards will not move, right? They're trained. They practice all their lives. You've seen the guards at the Tomb of the Unknown who stand at attention. And they don't move, but they see everything. And you cannot distract them. They have trained all their lives for that position. These are the strongest of the strong. And a Roman guard was placed there to make sure that those disciples did not come and take his body because whoa, there were some interesting things Jesus was saying. So on the third day, with all of that going on, the women go to the tomb expecting to ask the Roman guard would they be kind enough to roll away the gigantic stone that they had placed in front of the tomb for them so that they could go in and at least anoint his dead body. And their, their whole spirits were sagging, their, their heads were hanging, and they were talking to each other on their way, carrying their spices, saying, who will roll away? Will, will the guard? Will they help? How are we going to get in? And as they approached the tomb, Mark says, they looked up and the stone was already rolled away and the guards were gone. Of course they were. They moved to Egypt. Some of the Gospels said that they were so scared they fell like dead men. No, they ran. Because if the leadership found out that they had even flamed, get it? So the women go into the tomb and they find this guy sitting there all dressed in white. 
radiating. Have you ever gone for a hike out in the middle of the desert wearing all white? How many of you come back clean? Right? You ever seen a figure just totally radiating? It's a little odd. We don't always see that, do we? But it changes our lives when we do. And it changed theirs. And they were a little bit afraid. So the voice of the young guy says, don't be afraid. I know who you're here for. I, I know this whole story. I know what's going on. He's, he's been raised from the dead. He told you he would be. I told you so. I told you so. And now go tell all his disciples. <laughs> So the women left, right? And according to Mark's gospel, they didn't just leave, they fled. <laughs> they took off their high heels and ran. They were so scared. And they didn't tell anybody anything. The good news scared them so much that day. Which is probably the truth about such good news sometimes. It's so good, we don't know what to do with it. And it's so overwhelming that sometimes we don't know how to respond. And so we don't. I actually think that the good news of the gospel is probably the scariest news that's ever been shared. I mean, really, think about it. Jesus had proved his power when he healed people just with a word. They'd seen him walk on top of water. They watched as he calmed the stormy sea that scared sailors to death. He watched as he turned water into wine, stood up against the unfaithful religious leaders. They listened as he called God his dad. They were amazed when he forgave those who otherwise would not have been forgiven. They were a little bit challenged when he told them that they then had to forgive. That they had to love God, they had to love others, they had to love themselves. That they had to care for their neighbor. And oh, by the way, everybody is your neighbor. So the women are like, holy Hosanna, he's alive again. Which means, really, this Jesus is who he said he is. Which means, actually, those women who were the first witnesses to the resurrection learned, first of all, that he wasn't just saying this stuff. He was this stuff. And that following him meant they had to give their whole lives to him just as he had given his whole life to them. And the same is true for us. For me. Which means, if we're to be honest, much of our lives has to change because of this good news. Well, not all of it, right? I'm a nice guy. I mean, really, just last week, I let a guy go ahead of me in the grocery line. <laughs> See? I deserve the gift of the resurrection. I'm a nice guy. Just this week, I said a prayer for the guy in the street corner whose sign said, anything helps. So I gave him a prayer. Of course, I kept my EG's sandwich and french fries and half mix of lemon strawberry hidden below while I passed him, waved, smiled, and said a prayer for him. Surely that will give me a lifetime with Jesus, right? I even put on my Jesus filter this week. And I said something nice to somebody instead of what I was really thinking. <laughs> Surely God is pleased with my soul. 
but then I remembered more of what Jesus said. Then I remembered the hard things about forgiving. Seventy times seven, Jesus said, I have to forgive. Trusting that I'm blessed even when I feel persecuted. Remembering that I need to wear the clothing of kindness and compassion all the time. Not just on Sundays. And then I remembered that Jesus said that whatever is just in my heart and my head is as important as what comes out my mouth. Dang it. I'm sure the women at the tomb early that resurrection morning were scared for a lot of reasons, and they were afraid to say anything about it for a lot of reasons. But the one reason that scares me the most is that the resurrection of Jesus makes his whole existence real and meaningful, compelling and demanding. There's a hymn that we sing in Holy Week. It's entitled, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And during Holy Week, I spend a whole lot of time meditating on the third verse, which says, See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Poets, to me, are amazing. They have a way of capturing the emotion of what I'm feeling and putting it into words that I would never have put together. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. I think during Holy Week of what he endured. But then, on resurrection morning, I read the fourth verse. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. What scares me most about the resurrection is that it demands everything from me. It calls out every part of me to make it as God wants it to be. Not just the parts that I want to be like God. All my parts. And to be quite honest, that's not always the easiest way to live. Well, sometimes it is. It didn't take but a moment of my time to let that guy with two items go ahead of me. And it wouldn't hurt of me in any way to have given my lunch away that day to somebody who probably needed it more than I did. But it actually did hurt me to think bad things about somebody, even when I said good things to them. Because I wasn't honest. Now, that doesn't mean that I should have hauled off and let them have it. Because I could have. I could have thrown the Bible book right at them. Full force. I could have found a way to let them know what I was really feeling and work it through. Because really in the long run, neither one of us benefited that day from my dishonesty. I carried the anger within me. And sometimes, even this morning, it still eats at me. And the other person? Well, I'm afraid that I left giving that other person the thought that maybe it's okay to treat people that way. Which could mean he did it to somebody else. All because of my lack of ability to put my whole life into God's resurrection. Oh. You thought I was going to tell you you had to be nice to people all the time, right? 
No. But how we confront those things is important based on the resurrection, too. And in that moment, confronting that person would not have helped him, and it wouldn't have helped me. But holding on to the anger about it is hurting me and not him. And so if it demands my soul, my life, my all, then I have to give every part of me to the resurrection. So this morning I forgive him. And I forgive myself for holding on to the anger. And I let it go. And I hope I'm going to run into that person someday. And I hope they treat me the same way. So that I can treat them differently. Because next time I'm going to confront them. With the grace of the resurrection. Oh, see... While you change yourself, oh, people of faith. You need to do something that the women didn't do that morning. You need to share the gospel. And you need to let other people know that it needs to change their lives, too. But how do you do that? It has to be based on the grace that you know in the resurrection. So, when I see this person again, and they treat me badly again, I'll let them know kindly and gently. No, you won't treat me that way. And I'll let them know why. Which will probably scare them. Right? Have you ever said, you know what, I'm not going to let you treat me that way because Jesus loves me. It ought to be a conversation starter. It's usually an ender. Right? It's like those times I'm at the gym and I'm in the sauna or in the jacuzzi and you start chatting and somebody says to me, so what do you do? A lot of times I say I leave. Um, but more and more I've been sharing with them that I'm the pastor and... The responses over the years are always so interesting. I spend the next minutes or hours listening to why they don't go to church anymore and how awful church people are and, and how God let them down. And quite frankly, after a workout, I really don't care. <laughs> but quite frankly, after the resurrection, I do. Because it has to change every part of me. In every moment that God gives me to tell about this story, I need to take it. No matter who it is or where it is that God places in my life. And telling them that you're not going to treat me that way because Jesus loves me is usually a conversation ender. I'm making it a starter. It's my goal this year. Spend more time sharing with strangers what God has done in Jesus the Christ and how that's changed my life. And let every part of my life be transformed. And invite you to begin doing the same thing. You're nice people. You're faithful people. Why else would you get up the doggone early on a Sunday morning? Sit in the sunshine. These people are learning next year. They're going to sit over here. You're going to have to come a little earlier. Okay? You're nice people. You're good people. You're faithful people. Faithful people. Can you be more faithful? Are there parts of you that still need some work? I only see three heads shaking yet. Okay. Get honest with yourself then and you all ought to be shaking your head. Because yeah. the reality is this good news demands your life, your soul, your all every part of you, every moment of your life. Everything about you. The good news of the gospel is actually the scariest news of all. Because it demands everything from you. But how great it is. 
But before that, God gave you it. Gracious and holy God, we don't fully understand this gospel good news, what all it means in our lives, but here we are to praise you this early morning, for you raised Jesus from the dead. You proved to us that nothing can separate us from your love in him. Thank you. Thank you for your grace and your peace that you offer us in this Jesus the Christ. Let it become a part of every cell within our bodies so that everything about us is about you and this story. So that one day, everybody across this planet will know your great sickness. And there will be peace. For all. Forever. We thank you for the hope that we have in the resurrection. That our loved ones who have gone before us are already with you. And they know full well <coughs> may we now live our lives in a way that shows your love forever. Amen. Let's rise and sing our praise. Mm -hmm. Just as God has given everything to you, somehow you're in the plan that God is working on. It demands your soul, your life, your all. Share the good news. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. 
breakfast is ready. Come on back at 9.30 and then 10.45 for another one. Share the good news with all. Christ is risen. He is risen in me. Thank you for joining us. Happy Easter. <laughs>